Alex and Josie are from different worlds. They come to know each other after finding out they're birthday twins. Josie is inspired by Alex's work and decides she wants Alex to document her transformation story as she steps out of her tainted world into a new life. The Mm. book, None of This is True. The author, Lisa Jewell. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's Let's get get lit. lit. Hi, readers. This is Alexis. And this is Kari. And you're listening to Lit Society, a podcast about books and drama. Listen. It is. For the past couple of weeks, uh, readers, when we have a theme of the week, we've been pushing it to the end. We're continuing with that today. So we are going to jump right into the context and author. Kari, what would you like to share with us about today's author? Yeah, so we've covered, I think, two Lisa Jewell books, and we talk about her in both of those. So I, I encourage you to please uh, go back and listen to our episodes covering then she was gone. And what was the other one, Alexis? Hmm, I'm trying to remember. Maybe that was it. Oh, no, no. No, no. Did we do The Night She Disappeared? No. No. Because I did not like that book. Invisible no. Girl. <laughs> oh, it was Invisible Girl. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So those two episodes, we talk about the author. She brings, she's had some trauma in her life, and she allows that trauma, those experience to... um lighten up or give life to her characters she uses them Mm -hmm. as inspiration she turns that coal into a diamond because no doubt she's wealthy she has a lot of a lot of uh very popular well-received books these are all Mm -hmm. novels and they're usually a little dark but alexis would you agree that they're fun to read i probably shouldn't (laughs) ask you that right now Don't ask you, me. You ain't got to answer it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was not fair. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, they're a little dark. Lisa Jewell. Uh, mysteries she deals with. Um, yeah. And so if you want to know about her again, listen to those two episodes. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing. How about a brief synopsis without spoilers before our deep dive? Sure. I didn't prepare for this, but we can wing it. Uh, Josie and Alexis are two women from separate worlds. <laughs> However, they each share a birthday. In fact, they were born in the same hospital and now they live a mile apart. But their lives are very different. Have I mentioned they're different? But a lot the same. <laughs> also, Josie's unhappy and a little, you know, and Alexis is a Alexis. Alex is Alex. successful. <laughs> Alex is successful, but still a little, you know, in the end, three people will be dead. Ooh. Um, Alexis, who do you think would enjoy reading this book? Listen, you can pick up another Lisa Jewell book. I tell you that much. <laughs> if you enjoy reading this book, you will enjoy reading other Lisa Jewell books. Also, um, I think we covered an author, uh, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. I think she's in line with um, Jillian McAllister. I think I agree. she's in line with Lisa Jewell as well. So you, if you like Lisa Jewell books, you'll like. Uh, if you like um, Jillian Jillian's McAllister, book. you'll yeah. you'll like Lisa Jewell. Uh, Kari, who? Why did you choose this book? <laughs> I chose this book because it's um, been well received. It just came out, and it's from an author whose work I enjoy, even yeah. though it's like a usually a dark mystery that she writes, I found her books provide escape in a fun way. Uh, they're trash books. In, and I say that <laughs> meaning that to me, they're well written usually, or the ones I've read. Um, I'm not trying to give this one away, but the other two that we covered, I felt were well written. Um, but they don't, they're not teaching you anything about society or uh, social uh, um. dynamics. They're not trying to edify you. It's just have fun. Calm down. It's fine. No Don't look for plot holes. Go with the flow. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Um, why don't we take a quick break before we jump into our deep dive, okay? Okay, let's do it. And we're 
back. Woo. Okay, Kari, so have you decided to spoil the book? That's a great question, Alexis. I really want to discuss the meat and potatoes of this book. Mm-hmm. However, it came out, man. August. <laughs> So it came out less than a month ago. I cannot in good conscience give away this book. So this will be a non-spoiler, spoiler-free episode. But we're going to do our best to really talk about the themes that the book brings up. Oh, great. And I'm still going to ask Alexis if she enjoys this book and if she'll read another Lisa Jewell book after reading this one. Okay, well then let's jump into our deep dive of None of This is True. Okay. So the book opens in this way I'm not very fond of, where it's giving you a character that's not the protagonist, and it's giving you a look into a day in their life. Something about this day pertains to the rest of the story. So the book starts with the night. He's in the air-conditioned foyer. His vision's blurry. The girl is behind him. It's 3 a.m., but this terrible night is coming to an end. She pulls up. And he looks for the familiar, reassuring white blonde hair of his wife. But it isn't his wife. What? I thought you went away, he tells the dark-haired woman. I was, but she needed me, responds the dark-haired woman. Here, drink this. He drinks the bottle, closes his eyes, and waits to be home. Dun, 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 dun. Now the story begins. Um, I listened to this on audio and uh, I also read a few pages. So uh, I know that the audio does this thing that Alexis loves where it puts music in sometimes. (laughs) I do. I do. And if you're reading a dark mystery, it can be very creepy, (laughs) especially if you're reading it on two times speed. Oh, it'd be like, you'd be like, (laughs) exciting. So it's Saturday, the 8th of June, 2019. It's her birthday. Her and her husband, Walter, are going to this hip gastronomic restaurant, a place that they would never visit, a place where people go to be seen and also enjoy culinary cuisine. They order one bottle of champagne. Josie is the woman. She's 45 years old today. She finds it hard to believe because once she was young, um, Walter was much older at the time and everyone was shocked. Everyone but her. Married at 19 and a baby at 22, another baby at 24. There just doesn't feel like there was ever a peak in her life. It was just an abyss of trauma, she calls it. Mm. Mm. Walter hands Josie a bottle of Ted Baker perfume as a gift, and she quietly thanks him. I think this is a very shady reference to Ted Baker. They could have just (laughs) said perfume. And I actually love Ted Baker as a designer, but it's very Kate Spade. You know, it's very like, it's not great, but it could be like cozy. (laughs) Or what was that brand? Wow. (laughs) You know, it could be like powder fresh, and it's not, so be grateful. (laughs) Or designer <laughs> imposters. Y'all remember designer imposters? I perfume? do. Walgreens sold them, right? Yeah. Everybody walking around smelling like rubbing alcohol. <laughs> so, so funny. <laughs> then a party of 14 people walk in and they loud and smiley. They look like wealth. Okay. They somewhere in Rolex is somewhere in Patek Philippe's. I don't know. I'm just saying. And stuff. they look like a good time. That's what they, they look like. They do. This, if you walked in the restaurant and mm-hmm. saw these two groups of people, you are actively avoiding Josie's table, <laughs> Josie and Walter's <laughs> table. Even if they sitting by the bathroom, you just going to hold it all night because you don't even want to go over there. <laughs> but the other party of 14 people, they look fun. Uh, there's a woman with them cu- clutching a balloon that says birthday queen. Someone in their party uh, holds gifts, another flowers. They order six bottles of champagne. And then a woman named Alex, that was the one holding the balloon, um, Alex Summer. She seems to direct them all. They bring their glasses together and with premium shirt sleeves and tan skin, they cheer Alex. Alex opens present after present and no Ted Baker for her. And looking at Josie, uh, looking at her, Josie thinks how everything is wrong in her life, in her own life. Josie's looking at the other woman like, I got to change some things. Mm -hmm. So what does Josie do? 
she follows Alex to the bathroom. And there's this great scene like in every scary movie where uh, one of the protagonists is like bending down to wash their hands and they look up and so- in the mirror and someone is standing right behind them. That's what's going on here. So Josie is standing right behind Alex and she goes, hi. And Alex is like, oh, oh, hi. And Josie goes, I think we're birthday twins. Or who says birthday twins first? Uh, Josie, I think. Because okay, Josie followed her into the bathroom. She would Yeah, know. Josie followed in the bathroom. I forget Alex which ain't one. paying her no attention. No, she's like, oh, okay. She's like, yeah, we were born on the same day at the same hospital. Um, oh, wow, that's crazy. Now the moment of connection passes and Josie realizes that the moment had more meaning for her than it did for Alex because Alex's sister comes in and they start another conversation separately. And Josie's like, okay, bye. <laughs> So the next day, Josie starts listening. Yeah. So uh, Josie starts like Googling Alex, finds out she's a podcaster, a real famous one, kind of like Alexis and Kari. Uh, And Josie starts listening to Alex's podcast. On the show, a woman named Mary describes her controlling husband who passed away at a young age. Um, She got her life back after he died. And the people she loved picked her up, she says, and took them with her. Now, Alex is asking um, if Mary's husband played a role somehow in Mary's success. Um, Alex is a great interviewer. And she's like, you know, do you think that somehow his passing was basically a catalyst for you to get going? And would it have been the same if he had passed later on? Was the fact that he died younger um, actually a boost to you as terrible as that sounds and the woman's like you know that's a great question um, his death was a clean break and that's the thing about death there's no hurt feelings uh, no negotiations death is death and because he died early I was able to develop my business now she owns properties all over the world uh, she was able to nurture those businesses grow develop herself and her brand and she has founded the largest anti-domestic violence charity in the uk so long story short yeah she happy he died young she didn't like him when she got rid of him or he died and she was able to be rid of him (laughs) life was so much better and josie's listening to this like "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, common threads yes this should be me So Josie continues Googling Alex and finds photos that look like the ideal life. Meanwhile, Alex awakens to find her husband gone. It's the next day after the birthday um, party. And what do you think is going on here that Alex wakes up and her husband's not laying beside her? Well, I, you know, I naturally assume it's an affair like he's out cheating or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, he's not in bed again. I, too, when reading this, assumed it was an affair. In fact, his pillow is untouched, so he ain't even been in bed. Alex knows what's happened, and she knows what to expect. Back to Josie. So Josie arranges to, like, coincidentally run into Alex. Creeper behavior. Um, <laughs> and so. So she's like standing on a street corner in denim. She's always wearing denim jackets like a little girl. And I wear denim jackets. Uh, I mean, come on. That doesn't make you a little girl. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) So uh, she runs into Alex and is like, I have a proposition for you, girl. I listen to your podcast. Yeah, yeah. I know it's kind of weird. I was Googling you. But listen, I love what you do. And as you're always talking about women who have changed their life, I think it's time to switch it up. Talk to a woman who's about to change her life. You guessed it. It's me. My life is about to change. I'm on the cusp. And I think you should get in on this. The show It's going to be very interesting to you and your audience. Uh, let me know what you think. Now, she doesn't say it as confidently and directly. She like beats around the bush and it's a lot of um, hum, ums. But that's basically what she's saying. A few days later, they meet again, this time on purpose. Alex accepts Josie's proposal. She's like... I mean, you said your whole life is about to change. I'm intrigued. And if I'm intrigued, my audience will be, I guarantee. Guarantee. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Alex's marriage. Um, Alex is very torn right now about her marriage. Why is that, Alexis? Because her husband go out on drinking bends. Um, benders, are they called? I don't know. Well, he yeah. goes on a drinking um, binge and he'll come back like the next day so he he just 
and it hasn't happened in a while, but it's starting yeah. to happen again. And so mm-hmm. she's like, I really need to evaluate this. You know, I questioned him when I first started messing with him, but I need to check in with that list again. Yeah, she needs to see what the pros and cons are of being married to him are. And there's no thought in her mind that he's unfaithful to her. It's just that right. he goes on these benders. And I ain't never even heard of this. But this is like affluent. This is like when you have a substance abuse problem and you also got money. So he would just go out drinking, wander in the streets, and then just get a room somewhere at a hotel, uh, you know, and just mm-hmm. clock out. So she don't know where he is. She's worried about him. They have two younger children. I think their daughter's in high school. And the boy is like younger, younger. So um, he's like in elementary school, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she's like thinking about her children. Oh, yeah. Okay. That sounds right. So she's like, what should I do? I'm kind of at a turning point. But every time she rolls it around in her mind, she loves that man. And. This isn't a matter of him being unfaithful again. It's substance abuse. So he needs help. She's tried to help him before. He's responded to help. But as is typical with people who suffer from substance abuse, you know, he's fallen off the wagon. She's like, do I really want to do this again? Mm -hmm. What else? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then so she goes to bed. She notices he's not there. She doesn't know where he is. She's worried about him and then he calls so petulantly which is so annoying in a man who's in in the wrong (laughs) you know what I mean it's like manipulation (laughs) it's like feel sorry for me I don't feel sorry for you in fact he calls her at a time when just a little if he would have waited a little while she would have got a full night's sleep she's got to go to work now she's got to prepare the kids and she won't be well rested and it's like you couldn't even think of me in this little way But you are like, please don't kill me. I'm so sorry. I'm coming home right now, okay? She's like, oh. And this man ain't even like fine, fine. He the type of fine that's like very Tobias Menzies. Anyway. (laughs) I don't know him, so. (laughs) Let's talk about Josie's home life a little bit. Can you explain what Josie's going through at home, Alexis? Hmm. Okay, so she's got an older husband who's got health problems, and then she's got a he got and he's always on a computer. He got he. Uh, she mentioned a couple. Not she mentioned a couple health problems. I don't remember. Okay. Um, okay. and then she's got uh, a daughter that seems to be closed in her room all the time. Yeah. Um, like where she's games. in the restroom. Yeah, the room stinks. Yeah. It's not clear how she's relieving herself. It doesn't seem she's showering. And then she brings her um food every day, and it's baby food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a hotel, she like sits the baby food outside the door. Aaron, the daughter, eats it and puts the trays back outside the door. Mm-hmm. And, and then what and about their gives, other daughter? And she gives the impression that she's going to come and try to go into the room but something stops her from doing that and so when she thinks about this daughter Erin who's always in the room never coming out um, she also thinks about her other daughter who at 16 ran away from home and that's Roxy so yeah two girls two children and a husband just like Alex although Alex has a boy and a girl uh, but their lives are very different Josie's children are older both of them are past high school Um, And Josie wonders, like, all that time in her youth that she was raising her daughters, what was Alex doing? Living her life? Being great? She said, what do people do 30 when they don't have any children or family? Yeah. Do they, like, make friends, go to bars? It seems like it. It seems like they're getting their hair done and, you know, tanning and looking great and shopping and everything I couldn't do because I was raising these ungrateful children. And we are children. So, yeah, but um, Alexis mentioned that Roxy doesn't live at home anymore. There are times throughout the book where uh, because of the pain in her heart, uh, Josie sometimes thinks she sees Roxy and it's not Roxy. So, yeah, it's really, really sad, Josie's life. And yeah, her husband's like a bump on the log. 
So his her when she wakes up, by the way, her husband also is not in bed. He he uh, was in bed for a little bit. But as is typical, he got up in the middle of the night, went in Aaron's room and is not heard or seen from for the rest of the night. Now, of course, we are led to believe something by this interaction. We're like, oh, why he in his daughter's room all night? But That's then I don't okay. I don't know. Does he does it really say it's going into the daughter's room? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it says that. Okay, so what do you think it said? It so it, she says the floors creak and then there's nothing. So it doesn't really say. You mean at this point in the book? Uh-huh. Because it com- becomes very clear that he's in Aaron's room later. Later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah. Because at this point of the book, we don't have the ick so much as we have the pathos. We're like, oh, poor, poor Josie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. So, listen, Alex uh, eventually realizes that her her children attend the same school that Josie's children graduated from. So she let me tell you why out. she knows that because yeah, yeah. she's lurking on her social medias. Okay. She's Alex on her is social lurking media. on Josie's social media. Josie is lurking on Alex's social medias, and she sees the kids. Uh, Alex taking her kids to school, and there's a picture. Yeah, so you're talking now about Josie, but I'm saying that Alex real she goes to her children's school, and she realizes that this would have been the same school that uh, Josie's kids graduated from, the same school system or whatever. And so Alex start asking the staff. <laughs> About Josie's kids. Now, I'm happy that you kind of flipped it a little bit. You um, mixed it up a little bit because as we see Josie's behavior is cringy, Alex's behavior is sometimes mirrors Josie's, but it's not seen as cringy. Oh, but is it really? Is it really? Her her reaction, her Acts Look at you making reactions. excuses for shiny, beautiful Alex. Please continue. Her, it's very interesting. Her, the things she does are a reaction to what um, Josie does. Sometimes, but in this case, all she knows is she's going to start a podcast with this woman who wants to change her life or feel she's on the precipice of something. So... I mean, that's all she knows. And then she, she starts thinking, well, let me investigate the family. I don't know. It's kind of ain't creepy nothing wrong with Ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing <laughs> yeah, wrong mean, with that. I mean, especially if this woman has said, I'm going to open up my life to you and interview you. It's almost like carte blanche to start digging a little bit on your own, which she Absolutely. does. And the staff, the woman who's been on the staff for the longest, she's like, oh, yeah, who are you, who are you thinking about? And Alex is like, Josie, do you remember her children, Aaron and Roxy? And the woman goes, oh, oh, yes. Yes, I do. That family. <laughs> and she started looking around like, you ain't hear from me. But that family was weird. And Roxy was so violent. Like, she would beat up girls. And then we found out she was beating up Aaron. Listen, we had to call the parents in. And when they came in, that family, it was like the woman was a stone and the husband didn't have much to say. They were just odd. And then there were rumors. It's just, okay. All right. Well, that's all the business. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, throughout the book, we also get snippets snippets of interviews that are not conducted by Alex. And I think right away, we kind of discern that these are um, being conducted by law enforcement or a detective of some sort. And it's with surrounding characters. So we talked, they interview, I should say, they interview Josie's childhood friend. And that friend is like, Josie was always a bit competitive. She was a bit, what else, Alexis, about Josie does a childhood friend divulge? Mm-mm. Those are the main things I can think of. I, yeah. I can't think of anything else. And then she got with this old man, and it was like we grew apart naturally because it was yeah. just so weird to me. Um, so that's the that's Josie's childhood friend. But she she gives us the impression that Josie was not the easiest friend to have, and that um she could be a little dark. So uh, we also talked to Walter's son. Now Walter is Josie's older husband. He was married 
when he got with Josie, okay? So he got divorced and then he married Josie. So we're sitting with Walter's son from the first marriage. They live in Canada. And the interviewer is like, do you talk to your dad? He's like, no, I don't talk to my dad. Why don't you talk to him? Because he married a teenager, okay? And it was so disgusting. My mom cut off all communication, so we don't really talk to him. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And then he starts crying. Yeah, worth crying, I think. It's very sad. For sure. So, y'all, Josie's got this dog named Fred. It's a little, like, ankle biter, Papa Rainian, Papa Ch- Chihuahua, Papa Wawa. What is it? I don't know. A Pow Pow? Ch- pow? No. Bobo? <laughs> Those are bigger, actually. Yeah, Bobo. It's a Bobo. <laughs> so, she got this little dog named Fred. It's a Bobo. And... <laughs> She like she like treats this dog like the baby she wanted or never yeah. had or whatever. So Josie enters uh, Alex's home. Uh, she well she she takes the dog for a walk. Let's leave that there for a second for their first recording or at least their meetup before their first session. Josie enters Alex's home and is greeted by Nathan. Their interaction is odd. Nathan is all, was already a little creeped out at her. He saw her at the restaurant. She was like he was like oh she ugly. That's Nathan's <laughs> first. Her husband first is low time, down. But really we. <laughs> really it's clear that Alex isn't ugly she's just plain but there are re- really beautiful natural features about her uh, but she just looks so demure and beaten and run over uh, as far as her emotional state and that just repulses Nathan he like why my beautiful wife hanging out with you <clears throat> sorry y'all I got a cold men am I right that's a reference to this book I got this cold from my <laughs> husband so anyway, uh, she walks in. Her interaction with Nathan, Alex's husband, is a little odd. Um, then they do start recording. Now, recording with Josie. Josie explains right away her first romantic encounter with Walter, the power that she felt being a young girl, knowing what he wanted, her youth, her body. It made her feel powerful. At the moment, she explains the very moment that she knew she was entering into a world from which she never returned. She was 15 years old at a pub with a a man over 40 years old, a good looking man at the time, drinking alcohol. He put like some vodka in her lemonade or something. And Alex, while listening to this, is holding her composure while thinking, oh, my goodness, Josie, you married a pedophile but they don't say pedophile because it's london they say like pedophile which how insulting to the peters and what if your name really is peter file that's not cool moving on Mm, then they have another recording and josie explains then how she lost her virginity to her husband at 16 she said she wanted it to be perfect and he knew that so he proposed to her and then that happened (sighs) <sighs> later alex asks a neighbor boy about aaron and roxy so this is alex again snooping snooping and drooping now josie might be on google trying to learn everything about alex but alex is actually in the streets asking people the world want to know listen as i as i said before <laughs> yeah <laughs> Her yeah, stuff is reactionary. Yeah, it seems it's normal. very reactionary. And and on top of that, she is she knew what she was doing when she listened to her podcast already. She knew what kind of person she was. So this is not a problem that you're making it out to be. Wait, what? <laughs> who knew what kind of person who was? Josie knew what Alex was. She's an investigator. This is the type of story she does. Oh, so she should just know that Alex is going to be all in her business. Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. She's media. So anyway, um, so yeah, Alex, uh, yeah, Alex asked the neighborhood boy, do you remember Roxy and Aaron, Josie's children? And he was like, oh, oh, yes, I do. Uh, (laughs) One of them was in the same grade as me. She was scary, very dark. And then, um, (laughs) and then Alex is like, oh, okay. So you knew her before she moved away. And he's like, moved away or ran away. You know, there were rumors about things going on in that house. Some really dark stuff like abuse. So leave that there. Josie is out walking her dog, Fred, the Bobo. (laughs) I don't know why that's funny to me. (laughs) 
I don't know why. So the Bobo named Fred is getting a walk. Josie finds herself walking around the park, thinking about her life. And then she finds herself in front of Alex's front door. She just happened to walk to Alex's house. Then she just happens to find herself digging through the trash. (laughs) And she steals one of Alex's magazines. As one does. Wild. Yeah, it's pretty wild. So her activity is caught on the ring cam, you guys. Nathan is like, come here, come here. Ain't this your ugly friend? (laughs) And Alex is like, what? And so they're watching... Josie walk around the front of their house. They don't know, but this is actually the second Peer time in. Josie's been in front of their house. Uh, Peer in windows. Yeah. Now, the first time Josie was in front of their house, absentmindedly, she like hid behind a pillar and watched Alex walk down the street with her sisters. They all seemed loud, shiny, happy. She watched them all walk into the house and heard the husband, Nathan, greeting them. She imagined wine being poured, olives being placed into a bowl, and laughter, and she wanted it all for herself. She's also had a dream about the night when she met Alex, that they were all at a restaurant, but everyone was gone except her and Alex, and Alex looks across the table and tells Josie, I need you so Mm. yeah she wants alex's life this is heavy-handed and very clear she wants that life but she also thinks that alex needs her to save her alex needs saving where does she get that impression from she needs saving she wants to be needing saving and she needs to imagine that alex is in the same position Mm, she wants this to be like laverne and shirley we gonna go somewhere and be fabulous together and leave these men who are ruining our lives. Never mind the fact that Alex also has children. That she just don't be thinking about the kids. She just wants Alex to be free of the suffering that comes with men. Whatever. Mm. So, uh, yeah, Jesse done took the magazine out the trash. Nathan and Alex are bewildered. Now, Alex doesn't want professional or personal decisions to be based on what her husband thinks, especially these days when he going on benders. So she doesn't talk too much to her husband about the situation, but it disturbs her. Um, And then she starts wondering, what have I exposed my family to? Because her recording studio is actually in her garden. It's like this beautiful $10,000 studio that her loving husband, Nathan, built for her as a gift. It's a she shed. It's a she shed. But the She Shed is a state-of-the-art podcast studio because her podcast mm-hmm. is becoming successful. He wanted to support her and celebrate her. This is also why it's so hard for her to just break it off with him because she loves him and he loves her. He's addicted and to he's alcohol. Generous. He's, he's generous. He's generous and loving. He said, "Your mon- my money is your money and your money and your is your money. your money is your money. I know that's and who right. who don't love that? Girl, okay. if you don't want Nathan, I know somebody else who will know what to do with him. <laughs> Give him some black ashy babies. <laughs> That's from a movie. <laughs> anyway, this book is great too because it's a lot going on, but nothing going on. Uh, how did you read this story, Alexis? All on audio? All on audio, yep. Mm-hmm. So at this point of the story, you probably realize you have over a court, like a 75% of the book left. <laughs> yeah, still early on. So here we go. Another recording session. Um, this time Josie brings photos of her girls for Alex to look through. And it's alarming because in the first photo, there are these beautiful girls full of wonder and um, promise. And then in the second photo, Erin is emaciated with dark circles under her eyes. Roxy looks hard, uh, ran over. (laughs) And then Josie notices Alex's reaction to the photos. And she's like, don't judge me. And Alex says, what? I'm sorry. And Jesse says, oh, nothing. Never mind. (laughs) So there's that. So, yeah, everything Jesse is sharing leads Alex to tell 
Josie about Nathan's benders. Why did she do this? She just felt like Josie was making herself, you know, naked, exposed, honest. And she wanted to do the same. She wanted to repay the favor. <laughs> oh, you told me about your for? terrible life. What do I have going on terrible that I can share with you so this ain't a one-sided thing? Terrible idea. This is why yeah, therapists absolutely. don't talk about themselves. This ain't what you're here for. This is an interview of you. This show is about you. The podcast is about you, not me. Why well, I got to share me? But she does. She's like, oh, yeah, sometimes Nathan doesn't come home because he's drunk all night. And Josie looks at her and goes, does he cheat on you when he's out all night? And the thought never really occurred to uh, Alex. And she's like, oh, no, nothing like that. He just gets a room and, like, sleeps it off and calls me in the morning. And it's just terrible because I don't know where he is for hours. And then uh, Josie says, men. <laughs> <laughs> Josie is like <laughs> Josie's like you know what I wear a lot of denim and I just never launched when it came to my fashion sense so maybe you can help me because you always look so put together um, I inherited some money last year and I like to put it to good use just sprucing up my look and then Alex is like oh yeah no problem let's go shopping they go shopping Josie finds these dresses that make her look like the person she wants to be not the person she is she can afford them she buys them she loves them shopping for dresses period later alex receives a meme from josie and it's this these like memes that um uh you know a certain generation love where it's just a black box or <laughs> and it's just an inspirational quote <laughs> so anyway the quote is <laughs> you remember the quote alexis no it's talking about leave your husband though <laughs> So for a while now, Josie has been saving up these terrible memes in a Pinterest board to inspire herself. And she takes one of them. She's like, I'm going to send it to my friend Alex who needs saving. And it says, a weak man can't love a strong woman. He won't know what to do with her. She sends it with a bunch of emojis. Alex gets the message and is confused. She said, okay, well, maybe Josie is she sending said, me that's this. that's nice for you. That's nice yeah, that's for you. great for you. Let me just reassure her. So she sends her like a reassuring emoji, like a heart or something. Ugh. Anyway, <laughs> she, <laughs> she then right away is like, where's that bracelet my husband bought me for my birthday? Nathan, you see my bracelet? He's like, it was by the door. She was like, that's what I thought. It's gone. And this is the second thing she's misplaced recently. So she keeps misplacing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, soft spoiler alert. She ain't misplacing nothing. Josie is stealing from the her and has a little treasure drawer in her bedroom at home where she keeps little things she's been able, like Creepy. a tea cup spoon, a bracelet, that magazine she stole out the trash. She got a drawer soap. at home. Full, soap. Soap. She got a drawer at home full of Alexis, Alex's stuff. <laughs> Real normal. So, y'all, listen. Uh, where are we? 40 minutes? Mm, I'm just going to talk a little more. If you haven't read the book, it's okay. I'm not spoiling anything. I promise. Okay. I mean, okay. I'm spoiling in the sense that there are plot points, but there are twists throughout this book, and I'm not going to spoil any of those for you. Okay. Right now. If I do decide oh. to spoil them later, I'll let you know. I don't think I'm going to do it. So... <laughs> There's another third party interview at this point in the book. I remember we have like this detective or police officer interviewing surrounding characters. Well, this one is with a man explaining how excited and strange it was to receive a dog. This cute little Bobo dog from a lady who was in a panic. She was like, I need you to take care of my dog. Please give him a good home. And she gave us this dog. And the interviewer is like, but you kept the dog. And the man's like, of course I kept it. Look at the dog. He's so cute. <laughs> so that's that. Okay. Now back to the present, because obviously that's in the future. Josie asked Alex if she'd be sad if Nathan died. Real normal conversation. Like Alexis is always asking me if I'd <laughs> be it? sad if my husband died. That's normal. Wow. It's not. So Alex not thinks, at all. <laughs> and for, um, anyway, we ain't got to go there. So Alex thinks of the love she has for her husband and she responds, I'd be terribly sad if he died. Not only would I be without the love of my life, but my children would be without their father. So yeah, he goes, he has alcohol abuse issues and somehow I don't want him to die. <laughs> it's nothing wrong with that. Nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with that. With that. 
you know, mm-hmm. just because somebody is suffering that. and sick, don't mean you want them dead. Right. So, but uh, Josie is really disappointed, disappointed by this answer, <laughs> and she goes very home, disappointed. I want to shoot fi- uh, sh- fire, shoot fire, this fire shoot. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm sick. No one <laughs> asked, but I just need to repeat that. So I apologize for my brain. But anyway, um, I want to say this really fast so you find it jarring and shocking. So um, Alex is like, yeah, I don't want my husband to die. Josie is very disappointed, returns home, slaps her husband and tells him she hates him. (laughs) (laughs) Josie is like, I need everyone. (laughs) Yeah, so she's like, I need the people in my life to be smarter than me and <laughs> Alex is not acting smarter than me right now and that makes me mad so she goes home gets into an argument with her husband Walter slaps him and yeah she's like I hate you and he like I think she slapped the glasses uh, off his face <laughs> he puts his glasses it's not funny I'm sorry um, he puts his glasses back back on and turns to look at the screen he was viewing before she walked in so he handles it as best as he can, I think. Mm-hmm. So, wanting to get Walter's side, Alex texts Josie and is like, "You know, does your is your husband clear about the podcast?" And Josie's like, "Yeah, of course." Which how he gonna be clear about it? And it's kind of about leaving him and having a better life. And how he was a pedophile is a pedophile. I don't know. So, uh, but she says, "Yeah, he knows about it." And she's and Alex is but like, "She Great, hasn't I would made like that get- clear. She hasn't made that clear yet, though." Yeah, okay. Um, okay. So Alex is like, great, because in order for this to be fair, I think we should get his side of the story. And so um, I don't think I mentioned Pat, Josie's mom, but earlier in the book, like after they had a couple recording sessions and the mom was brought up, because right away, um, Alex is like, what did your mom say about your childhood? Josie's like, nothing. She said, what about the day you were born? What did your mom say? And Josie's like, that it hurt. And so um, and I, she'll Alex never like, do well, it again. And I'd never do it again. And so Alex is like, well, let's get the mom's side of the story. Like right away, if you don't mind, let's go to that property. And when she talks to her mom, it's clear that Pat has a name. In her profession, she is a woman that aspired to greatness, got pregnant by accident, and really feels like this child uh, deviated her plan, her purpose in life, kind of. Mm -hmm. However, um, there's something else that Alex is getting from Pat, Josie's mom, and that's that Pat hates Josie. At least that's how Alex feels from these this first conversation that uh, Josie is a kind of stink narcissist in Pat's life. And that Pat is a narcissist. And she starts, you know, projecting everything she learned from Psychology 101. And she's like, children of narcissists have it very hard. And no doubt, Mm -hmm. Josie's life was greatly formed by her mom being so obsessed with herself. Not wrong, but it's like, uh, this book is great about when dealing with perspective. How you can take one truth and based on the perspective, see a million different ways around that truth. So yeah, after an interview with Pat, Josie's mom, Alex has gone ahead and concluded that Pat is a narcissist. Uh, she hates her daughter and that that's what's formed Josie. And that's why Josie married this old man. And she also asked Pat, like, did you know it was going to happen? Because um, Josie met Walter, her husband at the house. Like he was a contractor that her mom hired and so the mom is like, no, do you know how the age difference? And Alex is like, yes. She's like, so how could I have known? I would have never thought that. No. Um, and then later on to um, in another conversation, a private conversation with Pat, Pat divulges to Alex that she thinks Josie and Walter deserve each other because Walter isn't necessarily more abusive than Josie. They're both just kind of trash. So. Mm-hmm. That's her conclusion. So then, yeah, back to Josie and Alex. Alex is like, let's get Walter's side of the story. Can you two come over for dinner? I'll make sure Nathan's here. It'll be great. Now, what are their thoughts about this dinner? What is Walter's thoughts when he hears about having to go to someone's house, get a haircut, take a shower and dress nicely? If I remember correctly, he's not really interested in doing it, but he's doing it for his wife. 
Um, yeah. And his wife also insists that he goes and gets some new stuff. And so he actually goes and does that. So, yeah, no one wants to think that I have to change everything about myself to meet your new friend. Like, what is that? Um, but at the same time, he's like, yeah, I'll do it for Josie. Let me go brush mm-hmm. my teeth for once. And then Josie is also very nervous about it. Um, so the night of the dinner, Josie tells Walter that she's going to tell Alex about the girls. Uh, we are to believe that this is a huge secret that we don't even know about as the reader. We don't know about it yet. Uh, Walter is like, are you serious? She's going to call the police. Why would you tell her? Oh, mm. what is that? Um, we can kind of deduce that this is about abuse of some kind about Walter abusing the girls, but it's not clear. He calls her insane. He's like, you really are insane, aren't you? And then she calls him a pedophile. <laughs> and he goes, excuse me? What did you just say about your husband? About me? Now the dinner. Now the dinner is the fulcrum of the story. Things kind of pivot based on this dinner. The, can you describe the night of the dinner, Alexis? So the night of the dinner, um, Alex and her husband, uh, I can't remember his name, but anyway. Um, Nathan. They, oh, Nathan. Alex talks to her husband, Nathan, because, you know, he go on his binges. And she was like, please come home for the dinner tonight. I beg of thee, come home tonight. He says, sure, I'll I do I do it. not want to be alone with these people. I need you. She makes yes. it very clear. I need your support support for real for real and so but he doesn't show he stays out drinking and so alex has to make this talk with this two weirdos then she feels Man, like they yeah are. it's true um but anyway at one point during this um their dinner she alex gets time alone with walter josie's husband and walter says don't trust nothing she say yeah and uh, Alex is like, what do you mean? And he's like, my wife has a very fluid relationship with the truth. You know, she's very flexible about it. So it's not that she's outright lying, but she's lying. So you just need to know that she's trying to play you. <laughs> and so Alex is kind of disgusted. Like, how dare this pedophile yeah. say that about his wife? Later on, her son is like, why was that woman listening outside the studio? Turns out Josie was listening to the whole conversation. Uh, It's awkward. The whole night is just awkward. Uh, Mm. Nathan never comes home. He actually goes on a bender and it's just disgusting. I'm leaving Alex there to deal with these two people. Uh, Josie and Walter return home at the end of the evening. They fight. In fact, it's the worst fight ever. It becomes physical, and Josie finds her way to Alex's front door. Now, imagine you just get rid of these dinner guests <laughs> from who knows where. You were so happy to get them out your house. Then the woman shows up to your front door in need, and she kind of just moves in with her dog, her Bobo dog. Alex wakes up to find the Bobo has boo-booed all over the house. And so because Josie is recovering from her injuries, Alex takes the dog for a walk, cleans up the poop. Um, The realization comes to her, though, that she's left her six-year-old boy home alone with a woman she doesn't even know. And she grabs that dog and races back home. But meanwhile, Nathan returns home from his bender and he's like, oh, hi, girl. And Josie's like, hello. He's like, what's wrong with your face? And she's like, a man. And he's like, whoa, really? That's terrible. She's like, yeah, about as terrible as getting drunk and not coming home to your wife after you promised you would. And he like, what? what? Yeah, I guess Slow I was terrible down. for that. And she's like, and because of Pump you. your brakes. She's like, because of you, my husband beat me because he thought a man would be here and he felt stupid hanging around with women. So it's because of you that I have these marks and wounds on my face. Thank you very much. And Nathan wow. is like, right. So uh, Alex comes home. He, she gets a look from Nathan. They have a private discussion and Josie sees Alex mouthing. What was I supposed to do? So, yeah. And this is where I'm going to stop because anything else I say will really probably ruin the plot for you. However, I will say this. Uh, Josie now lives with them. It doesn't last long. OK, <laughs> it's not like she's moving in for years. 
But she makes it clear she has nowhere else to go. Her mother hates her. She has no friends. Alex is her only lifeline. Alex, out of guilt, allows Josie to stay in their guest room. Uh, Nathan really hates this arrangement because he does not like Josie. Uh, not just because of that conversation. He didn't really like her from the get go. Uh, also, Josie starts saying things that saying things that are obviously um, manipulative. However, as a reader, you don't necessarily see those things as untrue. She's putting thoughts into Alex's head and those thoughts have real life consequences. Um, we start to learn also who Josie is. It becomes clear because although we're learning about her life and the situation she's in in her marriage and her daughter being a hermit and the other daughter being a runaway, we don't really know about Josie. We don't. So then we start spending time in her mind and getting her motivation. Um, and once it becomes clear what everyone's motivation is, it's too late. Uh, Nathan's late nights will lead to disaster. And in the end, three people will be found dead. Would you like to take a break before we get into our theme of the week? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Sorry for that extensive deep dive into none of this is true. No problem. So, as I mentioned, um, we'll do the theme of the week now. And each week we select a theme. Each week we want to do a theme. <laughs> we select a theme inspired by the book that we're reading. And this week's theme is really brief. It is why people lurk on social media. So you oh, see why wow. I had to you throw was really mad there. at Josie for just... <laughs> <laughs> doing what we all do what we all have done so not mad about it <laughs> but interested in it so okay. this is gonna really be brief why do people do it and i'm sure we can all think of reasons why but kari when you use social media do you always like comment and share Oh, no, I don't. In fact, the only time I like comment and share is when I'm trying to support someone's account. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would be happy just, you know, taking in content at will and then never supporting the person who posted it. But I, as a creator, content creator, I know that that's just terrible. So, but okay. to answer your question, but what's the reason? I really have to think my, my way through liking and commenting. Mm. So that's the reason why you don't, because you have to think your way through it. I do it, but it, I'm forcing myself to do it. It doesn't come naturally. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I am a lurker a lot of times. <laughs> um, I have no shame in that. And um, yeah, I, I, I think I don't feel like I need to be one more hundred thousand, like 50,000. You know, I don't need to be one more of those. They already got so them. you don't like because you feel like if they got 20 likes, that's enough. <laughs> Not 20 likes. I was I would be 21, but I don't have to be. <laughs> 35 so what number thousand. oh so the th your cutoff is 34 got it if you got 34 <laughs> likes on your photo alexis will be pretty like well much. i'm not liking this pretty much but i'll enjoy it and i might even laugh on it so i do send me engaged so i i can't be purely a lurker but sometimes i am well anyway, without that support without the likes without the comments it is harder for creators to get brand deals and to really support themselves through their work but listen, if they have 35,000, do they really need me? Oh, 35,000. Yes. Well, listen, if someone reaches a million, it's a very, very big deal. So, yeah, I would say that every like helps and counts. Come on. Anyway. But if it's a big brand, if it's like a big international brand, yeah, I'm not liking that either. I don't think Gucci needs me. <laughs> exactly. And those Alexis are, those is are traveling, though, at Alexis is traveling. <laughs> That 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 account might. Want I only some have support. twenty likes, so I need the twenty one. Okay, <laughs> I need the one more. Okay. I'm trying to get somewhere. <laughs> well, anyway, a social media lurker is someone who's active on social media platforms. You know the ones. Um, but instead of participating and engaging with others, they just consume the information that comes across their feeds. And according to an article, The Psychology Behind Social Media Lurkers, 
they identify four reasons why um, people lurk. And interesting note, I believe this is a Nelson study, and they said ninety percent. That you want to see your, if she prettier than you? Oh, go ahead. Ninety percent of your is he followers, still winning or is he losing? Am I winning the breakup or am I losing no, it? No, no. I could do this study. What else? What else? What else? I didn't even get it out yet. Oh, Sheesh. go ahead. Ninety percent of your followers are lurkers. Ninety. Yes, that's so true. Ungrateful. Nine percent occasionally and one percent actively engaged. But according to the y'all better 1%. like these posts. We tired. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> according to we the BBC, it, though. though, that has changed. Um, but this, so I don't know about these numbers because I'm still seeing the one nine ninety repeated, and I see limited action on the these numbers from the BBC even though the numbers are from 2012, it looks like. But in any event, they say um, 17% of the people actually engage, 60% occasionally, and 20% are, 23% are actually lurkers. So, I don't know. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. 60% are lurkers in oh, some okay, way. There we they go. may do a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. If if that's true. If that's true. But I think these numbers may be very specific to the UK. Oh, okay, got you. In any event, the numbers are higher um adjusted the, than the nine percent and the one percent um that I originally said based on the Nielsen study. So why are so little people engaging? What do you think the number one reason is, Kari? I mean, no other uh, field in which we take in information or media requires us to give back to it in real time. When you read a magazine article, you don't have to go and then like the article in order for the magazine to have uh, validation in the industry. Only in, with social media is it to be a back and forth. And that doesn't come naturally to us. The person you're interacting with isn't, you know, standing in front of you, it's not a conversation, uh, but it is in a way because uh, by sh liking their content, you're letting them know this is something I'm interested in and you're letting brand knows, brands know that this de person maybe deserves support uh, materially, financially, uh, but it doesn't come naturally. It's um, it's a odd thing to do to like a post, actually. It doesn't feel, does it, it doesn't feel intuitive to our interaction with social media. Okay, so I, I'm going to lump that in with this one. Um, people are afraid to have um, have their comments mocked. So, so there's got to be something behind that. Not only is it not natural, there's a fear associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody will screenshot your stuff and it'll be posted and become viral. Yeah, That's I ended up on a, a website once that was like dumb comments really yeah and it was a comment i made but i didn't i don't know how did you I don't feel think I about cared. that <laughs> I well, didn't care. so so then that's another thing you gotta not care yeah. you absolutely gotta not care so there's that concern and then another one is that they're intimidated by other people in the community so you're posting on um gucci's page and they post something that everybody should dislike but you you like it or maybe that, oh, how about this? People are posting on the shade room and they got all <laughs> kind of comments, you know, and some of those comments, they move up as they're liked more and you don't feel like you can contribute. Uh, oh, like comments are pinned to comment. the top or they're, the ranking brings them to the top and you feel like yours won't be heard. Yeah. You feel but like listen, yours won't Alexis, be heard. Um, under the pavement, I'm looking at a highway right now in front of me. Under the mm -hmm. pavement is ideally trash. Not ideally, but uh, <laughs> probably trash. And okay. then under that trash is probably like the foundation, the bedrock. And then you get into more just icky stuff that comes from mm -hmm. our sewers. And then under that are the shade room comments. Because <laughs> I have found the shade room commenters hate grammar they hate english <laughs> they hate all languages and they hate education 
Now, if you're a Shade Room commenter and you're like, no, I don't. How dare you? Listen, I've commented on the Shade Room too. Calm down. But I have seen things on there that obviously, like the obvious conclusion from this post should be one thing, but the comment show is something totally different. So if you start getting into the comments and you're like, hey, maybe a 14-year-old shouldn't be doing this because it's illegal in five states. They will attack you like, oh, you the not you the you know you the ops. How dare you? Why are you even here? I hate you. So I mean, yeah. so is is is, is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth it to be attacked? By others because in if the you community get the vitriol of you're engaging? one, if you get the vitriol of one uh, loose screw person they might start following you throughout the internet and that ain't worth it. Most Have people you that ever... see your comment won't care, but that one person that ain't got a job <laughs> to be Have honest. you ever seen like a long thread of comments back and forth comments on oh and it's so pathetic it looked pathetic on both sides y'all both look crazy y'all both look crazy and one of y'all is probably right but why does the right one care so much (laughs) stop just stop stop it's wild out there don't know each other so anyway you're afraid it was fun when rihanna did it Back in the day, y'all remember when Rihanna used to troll people? She would get their like medical license and take a photo, and then be like, "This person, as ugly as they is, got the nerve to tell me." So, and we'd be like, "Rihanna, you a superstar? You can't do that." <laughs> I'm giggling the whole way. Yeah, so, <laughs> she don't do that no more. She got a new life. She got two kids and an ASAP now. She don't mm-hmm. do that. Not at all. So they're afraid to be mocked by others and intimidated by cooler comments. That's the thing. And then the third (laughs) one is (laughs) the brand doesn't understand, um, doesn't understand you based on the content that they're posting. So it's like, uh, so one of the uh, analogies they give is if you're ever told a dramatic story by your best friend only to have them totally misinterpret your reaction then that is how um, a person might feel about um, commenting or liking um, a post. Okay. And then finally, they're afraid they'll be uh, disappointed once they engage. And that goes back to what you said. Somebody might not see their comment. So you got the shade room and you post your little comment out there and nobody likes it. It's just sitting out there. It's so, I've done that it before. Really Not for? recently, but I went back like, oh, this is clever. This about to go viral. Uh, I like how I made that word like this word. And you know, ooh. and then five days later, it'd be like one like. And then you go back 10 days later and somebody took that like away. Because don't nobody be wanting to like the comment that ain't getting the other likes either. <laughs> They went back and took away. They like, oh, man. <laughs> so only one person re- really related to you. <sighs> That's not the look. I remember want. the first time Tristan Thompson was caught out in these streets. Oh, I was lighting him up. I had so many <laughs> jokes. A couple of them hit, but most of them were just mind vomit. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, those are the four reasons why people lurk on social media. Listen, the moral of the story, don't hold back because people don't engage because they may still buy your product, talk about your content with others, and even listen to your podcast. (laughs) And that is our theme of the week. Woo! I love it. Thank you, Alexis. That was a great theme and really on point with the story that we read this week. So I really appreciate your research and helping us shine a different type of light, a different angle on this story. Now, may I ask, let's get into the final verdict. Is that cool with you? Yeah, let's do it. So what was your final verdict of none of this is true? Would you think of the story? Would you recommend this book? What do you think, girl? I like the way Lisa writes. You, um. She really does a good job of telling the story. She's an excellent storyteller. And we've covered a, a few, as we mentioned, of her books. I think that second one we didn't care so much about. So there's a few we like and a few we don't like. I've even read one of hers that I don't didn't really like. But she tells a great story. I don't I mean, like her life story sounds tragic, but 
my goodness, her tragedy has turned into great reads. Okay, the way she puts her spin on these stories and the details that she pulls out. Mm -hmm. She's got all these characters and these characters have meaning and value. They are part of the story and they make sense to be a part of the story. So Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the book. She ain't afraid to take nobody out. You'd no, be like, but the whole book about all. this person, you sure they did? So yes, they are. Move on. So <laughs> it's like, so what? She do not I like care. that though, because it mm-hmm. you don't get relaxed in the story. You know that anything can happen in a Lisa Jewel book. Hold yeah. on, kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I really did enjoy it. I would definitely recommend it for people who like this genre of story. Um yeah. Again, her the characters are meaningful and not overdone, and it uh, it's. I would read it. I definitely read it again. How about you, Kari? What's your final verdict, and would you recommend this book? I would say I've read about four or five Lisa Jewel books, and this is my favorite by far. Um, I felt that the pacing in the first half lingered just a little. Um, But it it made up for it in the second half. And everything that we learned in the first half of the book is actually necessary. So uh, no regrets there. No, you know, I'm not upset about anything with that. Uh, It's interesting that both Josie and Er Alex are so similar. Both of them are bored and full of regrets about their choices, Mm -hmm. especially within their marriage. And they're both looking for escape and using each other to find that escape. Uh, But it don't really go the way they think it should go. Yeah, uh, and then at the end of the book, detriment. it's a twist and then an epilogue twist, which is fun. It's fun. <laughs> um, and it, shows, it shows that perspective can take one event and make it uh, a bad thing or just a thing. It's weird. It's like one thing can happen and based on how you see it, it might be the thing that ends your life or not. Uh, yeah. Some things, though, are fact. And in this book, there are some facts about Walter uh, that are not negotiable. Uh, So even how they happened might be questionable. And when they got married, she was of legal age. okay? but he was married at the time and he was also in a relationship with someone else. We'll find Uh, out uh, before he met before he started dating Josie. So the age I mean, she got married at what, 18 or 19? I, 19 yeah, actually 18. oh 19 19 19 yeah so i don't know i don't know i don't know and that's all i'll say about that but uh yeah w- walter does spend the entire night in his daughter's room now what is going on in there there's some question about that but just stepping back how normal is that how innocent is that really you know what i mean it's like spend, a lot spending it's the about evening in your daughter's room hmm Spending the evening in your daughter's room. Not the How evening. Is that? The evening and night. And uh-huh. when does he sleep? <laughs> you understand? He's retired. Okay. Well, look. Why he got to be in there all the time? And then um, the fact that Aaron is in her room gaming 24-7, that's not disputable. That's not debatable. That's a fact. Anybody not trying to help her out of her current situation is an enemy to me her mom right? yeah mm. so and, yeah. and some and the person closest to her isn't really trying to help her either so there are, mm-hmm. are this book is so great to me because it's all about perspective there, there are issues, issues here and i think everyone that reads this book will get something different out of it even the conclusion will be different yep. based on your perspective but it feels like a whole story so it's not it's not an open-ended story at all. It's closing them ends, but your perspective, it's allowing to, to shape how you feel about the truth within those endings. Is this all true or is none of this true? Car, we can have a good. whole separate discussion about the yeah. ending. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So please, you guys, uh, when you read this book, if you choose to do so, reach out to us on social media or via email and uh, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you felt about the ending. Of course, we'll respond, especially to emails. We always do uh, when you guys make an effort to reach out to us uh, via email. Mm -hmm. And that's ask us at litsocietypod.com. We want to know what you think about the ending of this book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Kari, what are we reading next week? 
We are reading Because I Could Not Stop for Death by Amanda Flower. Oh, I've never heard of this. Ooh. Okay, me either. Thank you for listening to the Society. We look forward to meeting up with you next week, Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria and Kari Herrera. Support hey. the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us because we love you too. We love you. If you've enjoyed what you just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, read, read something. something. <laughs>